It's a privilege to serve the kids. They, I know that they are your most precious treasures that God has given you. And so thank you so much for entrusting them to us and that we get to do it together. Um, so as I was thinking about this Sunday coming and we have been talking with Alejandra and Emily who are the team that works together to help with the kids along with many, many others with the parents. But um, God just like dropped in my heart was starting to talk to me about stories and different people in the Bible. And um, now I'm more of a teacher. I'm not going to be, I'm not a preacher necessarily. And so this may be a little more teacher-like than, <laughs> than something else. So, um, but you know, since it's Legacy Sunday, and that's when we see, that's what we do with the kids, right? We tell them stories and then they glean from those stories and we can use them. And that's how we learn things, right? We hear and that's how we learn through other people's narratives, right? And so, but I was thinking about, you know, the of course, the Bible is the story of God's people. And so, like, the, in, in the Old Testament, when Moses, in, when Moses, God introduced himself to Moses, he said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. The God, I am the God of your father, Jacob. I am the, or Israel, and I am the God of the father, Israel. Or, um, sorry, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Um, and so as he introduced himself, he introduced, he is the God of each of those generations, but he is the God of all generations. But we can know him as the God of this generation, but he is the God from the beginning to the end. And so we, it's pretty awesome when you think about how God works throughout all the generations. And so that's what these narratives that uh, there's a couple different, it's two women. Well, it's their women, women, and there's some men in it as well. I'm not doing that because I'm a woman. It just, that's how God spoke to me about it. So, but, so we're going to look at these two women, the story of Hannah and the story of Ruth, um, if I can get through all of it. Um, and we're going to see what God did in them. And hopefully we can understand how God is moving, how God moved in them, but how he is going to live, he moves through our lives as well. Okay, so if we could go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, there's going to be some pronunciation problems here probably in about two seconds, but I'll do my very best. Um, now, there was a certain man from Ramethim Zophim and the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Ilhu, the son of Tehu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day, had come, the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to her sons and her daughters, but Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Okay, so just a little bit of context. I'm a context person. I kind of like to know what's going on in the story a little bit. But this, in the time of the people of Israel, they are coming out of the time, when this story occurs, they're coming out of the time of the judges. And, of course, if you know much about the Bible, and if not, you should be taking Harold's class. A uh, little plug there. Okay. So the season of the judges and the people of Israel, was a, it was a cycle that the people of Israel went through where they decided that they wanted to sin and not listen and obey the law of the Lord anymore. And then usually what would happen is some people would come take them over, or there would be a threat against them, and then they would be like, oh, Lord, help us, we're going to die. And they'd cry out to God, and they would repent, because God would send a judge to come and, you know, instruct them and to call them to repentance. They'd repent, and then they, the, Lord, the, the Lord would be with them again. And then they would decide that they didn't want the Lord anymore. You know, okay, so it's a cycle, okay, that they're going through in this season. And also, in, the, in chapter 3 of, of Samuel... The scripture says that the word of the Lord was rare in those days and visions were infrequent. And so that was the context of the time of Elkanah and Hannah. And so what's interesting about that is that the, in verse 3, chapter 1, it says Elkanah would go up year after year to sacrifice and worship. So this tells us that he was a man who was following what God wanted. 
he was going and he was doing as God had commanded him to go take his family, to go to Shiloh, they, and then they would sacrifice, and then they would eat a portion of what they sacrificed because he was a priest. Okay, and so he would have been considered a faithful man, an obedient man, during a season when the people of God were disobedient and a cycle of disobedience. And um, so it's just important to know that that is the family culture that Hannah would have been in, okay? Um, So Elkanah would give a portion of the sacrifice to his family. He gave a double portion to Hannah. So there's thoughts around that. We don't know 100% that probably Hannah was his first wife. He probably loved her, couldn't have children, had the second wife, then had children. Okay, so that's maybe the context of that, okay? So then it goes on in verse 6 to say, Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly, her rival being the other wife, would provoke Hannah to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 7, It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, Peninnah would provoke her, and Hannah would weep and not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat, and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Now, Hannah was distraught here, of course, and downcast, because year after year, she would go up to Shiloh, and her, this other woman would basically taunt her. And so she, was, she wasn't eating or drinking. Now, what's important to realize is that this was a part of the obedience, part of the law of what they were doing as they were coming up, and that was the purpose for which they went, was to sacrifice, and part of that reward was they could eat and drink of the sacrifice. So Hannah was not engaging in the obedience of what God was providing for her. She was not eating or drinking. Um, but this year was going to be different, and the reason that's different is because her husband said to her, and he, he actually challenged her, And he asked a few questions. Now, how many of us, sometimes we need somebody to just ask us a few questions. (laughs) Okay, right? And so maybe we aren't walking in an obedient place, but God comes and God comes and challenges us, or we have people who are faithful in our life to ask us questions. And so Akana asks her some simple questions, which made her think about the blessings. It had to have, because in the next verse it says, then Hannah rose after eating and drinking. So Hannah decided to come into line and into obedience with with what was required of her. And she submitted herself to her husband. She submitted herself to the Lord. And she said, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to eat and drink. So we see a change there. Something happened. Something shifted because year after year, she didn't eat. But now in this moment, she changed and said, okay, And you see that she eats and drinks. And then here comes the important part, because she goes to the altar after this. Okay? It says, Now Eli the priest was sitting at the seat of the doorpost at the temple of the Lord. In verse 9, so she she submitted to her authority, and she went to entreat the Lord. Now, verse 10 says, "She, She greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. Now, she may have come into obedience, but she was still heartsick. She still longed for a son. And so even though she was there, she wasn't in a place of faith quite yet. She hadn't come to that place. And so she she wept wept, and she asked the Lord and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but you will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. So she asked the Lord for the desire of her heart to have a son, and she committed to give this son that is not even conceived yet to the Lord. Okay, so just setting the picture here. Eli, this is, goes on in verse 17, saw Hannah praying. So he sees her praying, and she is like, She's praying and she's mumbling. She's, or she's not mumbling, I'm sorry. She, her mouth's moving and she's not saying anything. He comes up to her and is like, thinks she's drunk, discovers that's not the case. And then in verse 17, he, after hearing her petition, he said, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went with her and ate. The woman went. 
her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So when the priest or the man of God came and, and encouraged her and said, go in faith, she was able to go. I, I believe Hannah went in faith. So she came into obedience to the Lord, and then she left in faith. Okay? All right, so she left. So then we're going to continue. I know it's a lot of Bible, but let's let the narrative tell us, okay? Let's, let it, let, let's see what God did here. Okay, so Hannah left in faith. In verse 19, they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to the house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Remember, she prayed, Lord, remember me. And the Lord remembered her. Our, man, our, our prayers work. God remembers us. It came, about, it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Sorry. Hannah then returned to Shiloh with Samuel. Okay, so what ends up happening here is in, so she ends up weaning him and bringing him back. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. So she takes it back to Shiloh where the house of God is where they sacrificed. Okay? And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside, uh, beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. She left him there. And that's what it goes on. And I encourage you, if you've never read the book of 1 Samuel, the story gets even better, okay, <laughs> of what happens here. But one thing I want to point out here is that Hannah followed through with her vow. She, she said she committed to the Lord, and she said she would do it. And I was just thinking when I was thinking about that moment that she prayed that prayer, I thought about all the times I've come to the altar, and I have asked God for something I mean, how many times do we come up at the end or, or we're at home and we ask God for something? And it's like, I, I think there's been times in my life I've, in an emotion, committed to something, but I actually hadn't come from a place of obedience or faith. But Hannah came from a place of obedience and of faith, and God answered her prayer. And so when we come to these altars, it's not just a moment to just kind of in an emotional moment. It's a place that we can really come in faith and make a vow. And then when we, when we commit something down here on the carpet to the Lord, he remembers us. He remembers. And so we need to remember, <laughs> right? We have to follow through on our commitments to God. And so when we commit to those little ones back there, and we, and we say, Lord, they're yours, and we have given them to them to him, we have to trust him with them. We have to believe God. We have to live our lives in such a way that reflects who he is. So as we walk out, they will see him. And God remembers that. Let's, when we make those vows to him, let's follow through with those vows. And God will help us. You know, sometimes, you know, we say things, and then God's like, do you remember when you told me this? Has anybody ever had that happen? You've committed something to God, and then he brings it back to your mind, and you're like, oh, yeah, I said that, Lord. And I repent for not doing what I said I would do. So it's a pretty amazing story of how Hannah, because these two stories are about, I'm talking more about from our point of view. I could talk about all the things that, the, that Samuel went on to do, and I will mention a few of them because they're pretty awesome. But because of Hannah's, obedience and faith, a son was produced. And as you go on to read the book of Samuel, Samuel ended up being the final judge over the people of Israel, and he was a prophet to the people of Israel. Uh, God spoke to him at a young age as he laid at the altar. That's one in 1 Samuel 3, and that's what we want. He, so, so Hannah brought and said, here, Lord, I give him to you, and he slept by the altar, and then God spoke to him. It is important for us as parents to bring our children to the house of the Lord. You know, I know there are a lot of things in our lives that can come in, and, and, and there are good things that we can do. You know, sports are good, and, and all, different things that all of our children would love to do. But always, always remember that they belong to the Lord first. Especially if, we, you know, we do baby dedications, and we bring our kids up, and we say, Lord, we cry, and we pray, and which is good. We should, because this is our most precious gift. Um. But again, we make those commitments to him, even when they're teenagers, 
even when they don't see it, and you love your little baby, you know, and now he's 13 or 14, now he has other commitments and things he wants to do, and I don't, bring them to the house of the Lord, okay? Always prioritize the the house of God, because that's, that's where the presence of God is. It's not just about us people. It's to Jesus. It's to who he is. We, we have our part to play. We have to do that and bring our kids to him. Um, he anointed kings, and we'll talk a little bit about that with the next person I'm going to talk about. So Hannah, Hannah had a great legacy, and it all started from obedience and, a, and walking out of faith and then following through with what she'd said. She had also an entreaty of the Lord and then following through on what she said. So now we're going to go over to the book of Ruth, Ruth for, uh, chapter 1. I'm going to kind of just quickly sum up in case you haven't, don't know the story of Ruth. A lot of you probably know the story of Ruth, hopefully. But just very quickly, um, there was a man named Elimelech. And he was married to a woman, Naomi, which what I actually thought was kind of an interesting, this is kind of a teacher nerd moment maybe, but that Elimelech and Elkanah were both Ephraimites. They were in the same lineage, which I thought was kind of interesting. I'm sure Tom could extrapolate that out into some great thing. But I will move on. Um, and so Naomi and Elimelech, and they had two sons, and they were living in the land of Moab uh, because of a famine. And what happened was that the husband and the two sons—sorry, uh, the two sons—got married, and they had a daughter. Or they had their wives were Ruth, and the other son married a woman named Orpah. Okay. Anyway, all the guys, all the men die, and so then Naomi, who is the mother, she says, uh, "I can't stay here anymore. I'm going to leave." Okay. And so in verse 14 of chapter one. Um, the women, all the women, they lifted their voices up and they wept. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And then, the, and then Naomi said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the, word, or may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, Naomi said no more to her. Now, a couple distinctions to make between Hannah and Ruth. Hannah was an Israelite. Ruth was a Moabite. Okay? Uh, Moabites, are a, that actually was not a good idea that the sons of Israel would marry a Moabitess because they were not the people of God. They were, would have been considered pagan at that time and so would not have been a good thing. Okay, so... Um, Ruth, however, chose to leave and choose the God of Naomi and cling to the God of Naomi. And when she did that, she changed her whole trajectory. Now, one thing I want to say, because we all come from different backgrounds, we all come from different places, and so Hannah, you know, I was raised, I was raised in the church, and so it could be maybe you weren't. And maybe you've come to the Lord later in life or, you know, bef um, after your children are adults or whatever it could be. It doesn't matter where we begin. It's when we give our lives to the Lord. We can have a godly legacy in the earth no matter what. If we submit our lives to God. So your past doesn't define the destiny of your legacy. Jesus defines that, and he is faithful to a thousand generations, like we sang this morning. And so have, out of faith, believe, even if you have adult children, it's because of, like, the faith that Hannah and Ruth have. We live with, if we can be obedient and have that kind of faith, God will do the work. And so don't, don't judge yourself and don't put God in a box based on your background and where you've come from or how you've come out of. Know that he is faithful to complete it, and he can bring them. And in the end, it's his job to save us, right? All right. So her whole trajectory changed, and you can have a godly legacy no matter what your background, okay? So a little bit more on the story. I'm going to kind of more sum it up. But Naomi and Ruth, they come back to Bethlehem. And they are in a place of desperation. They have nobody to provide for them. All the men are gone. That would have been the provision for them. And so 
Ruth decides, Naomi sends Ruth, and Ruth ends up going to a field to glean at, during the barley and wheat harvest. And so during that, that time, they would have these large fields, and the, these women could go, and they could glean, kind of take, pick up the scraps behind, um, is what Ruth would have done. They had maidservants and people who would go and go behind and, and pick up after they had harvested. And that, but what Ruth did is she basically kind of followed behind and was trying to get just whatever she could to help feed her, her and Naomi. And so it ended up she went to a field of somebody who would have been a kinsman, which is the name of Boaz, and he was in charge of the reapers of that field. And so he had found, Ruth found favor with him. And he said, you know, stay here. He basically gave her protection because she would have been a single woman, open to all sorts of things that could have happened to her in those days. And he provided protection and said, no, stay in my field, be here, and became a covering for her. Okay? And so she was able to get protection for that. And so in verse 10 of chapter 2, It says, then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? See, she's very aware of where she came from because she wouldn't be, everybody there would have known, would have heard where she came from. She's a Moabitess, okay, would not have been a good thing, all right? Um, Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me, and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work, and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And so... Boaz recognized that Ruth was a woman who walked rightly, that she did, right by, she did right by choosing the God of Israel and by basically changing this trajectory of her life. And so the, 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 her decisions came to his ear and walking rightly. So we don't always do everything right. We've already talked, Tom's already talked about it this morning and uh, mentioned, but we, we want to be pleasing to God. Right? We want to be pleasing to him and walk righteously before him. And for our children as examples, again, it comes back to walking in faith. But our faith produces something in us that makes us want to walk righteously before him. And choosing the right things to do and where to go and the right things to watch. And the, how to deal with our cell phones. And how, right? Do you, you know what I'm saying? It's like we, it, it's not, I mean, our faith has feet, like it says in James Faith without works is dead. And so we, we must also, we have faith, but we walk those things out and as, it, as an example to our children of how to walk righteously. And Ruth's fame of that, how she walked righteously, was an example to all around her. All right. So customary in Israel, the story is basically ends up where she goes to Boaz and basically wants him to marry her so that she will have covering because in that time, you can be redeemed. The one, it, Ruth could be redeemed if she were to have a, somebody marry her that would be from the line of her family, of the line that, um, of Elimelech. And so Boaz was a relative of their family, but he wasn't their closest relative. So there's a whole thing about that and how she goes and lays at his feet and la 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 la. Anyway, you can read the book of Ruth if you want to get the whole story of how, how they ended up getting married. But he ends up going to the closest relative and says, do you, do you want to marry her? And he says, no, I, I, I have other responsibilities. Okay, well, he says, I'm going to marry her and I'm going to redeem her. And so he ends up marrying her and she is bought into the family. And this is, I just loved this verse because in, in verse 11, in chapter 4, verse 11, it says, all the people who were in the court, meaning, so this was, again, well known in Bethlehem, and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathath and become a famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to, Ju- to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. This is an amazing thing that she, again, going back to how our past does not define us, it was they, the people of that day were saying, you are now part of us. You are no longer are defined by this, but you are now in the line the prayer is you are now in the line 
like Jacob. Because if you don't know, Rachel and Leah were Jacob's wives. And so now Ruth has been joined and grafted into the family, redeemed, fully bought back out of what could have been a desperate situation. And she was able now to become in the line. And we, of course, know, as it says in verse further down, that she became the mother of Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse is the father of David. And she now is the great-grandmother of King David. And of course, we know that it all, that line extends on to Jesus. And so, and what's it, there's so many more stories like that in the Bible. I mean, I think it's like the Boaz's mo- mom or grandmother is, was Rahab, who was a harlot. I mean, if we just think about the stories of how God buys back and redeems us, and redeems the people in the Bible, how he does that for us, and how no matter what, we're, we're joined and put into his family, and then we can have a legacy that goes further out and stretches far beyond. Now, in verse 16, it says, Then Naomi took the child. So Naomi was, of course, the mother-in-law. Her, her legacy is gone now. This is now... Boaz, right? I mean, Naomi was married to Elimelech, but now Ruth is a part of this line with Boaz. I mean, they're still in the same family, but I was just thinking this morning about that. Like, even if you don't have children anymore or didn't have children or whatever, like her children died, but maybe you don't have children. The verse says, the Naomi took the child, laid her in her lap, and became his nurse. The neighbor woman came Uh, gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. And I'm just thinking about people who, maybe you don't think you have a legacy because it's died or your hope has died. But you do. And God can give you a legacy in the earth. Don't despair. You have a legacy in the earth. Believe, we believe that God brings us into the house and he gives us. I know, I know there are kids back there that look at people. You know, I think like Kristen doesn't have children now, but man, she has a legacy. We have legacy in the earth. God can get us to where he needs us to go because he's faithful to us. You know, and I knew my great-grandmother. But that's the thing is <clears throat> David was, uh, Ruth was David's great-grandma. I knew her. I knew my great-grandmother, right? Do you guys know your great-grandmother? I'm like, it's possible he, you know, we don't think about in those stories, they're separated books, and so we don't think about, like, how they could have known. I don't know if they did. Maybe they didn't. But, but it, it's, it's just amazing to me. It just blows my mind to think about how God weaves that together and how it, how Ruth became a part of that line. Um, yeah, anyway, okay. <laughs> Get all attractive the there. All right, so these, this, just to sum up a little bit and wrap it up here, okay. So these are stories of two women who they chose to submit their lives to God first, to walk in obedience by faith. They entreated the Lord. They acted rightly. And God produced legacy that impacted the earth. Something else that's really awesome is that Samuel, of course, we talked about the, Hannah's son, ended up anointing Ruth's great grandson to be the king. Isn't that awesome? Those two lines, isn't that amazing how God joins and knits destinies and people and legacies together? And I was thinking about even just an example in my own life, and I know you guys have examples too. Tom talked about, I've known him for a long time. And, um, but Tom came out to where I'm from in Missouri and Kirksville. And then of course we're out here now because of that. But in 2011, before Tom even moved out here, Danny and I came out here for a very short season for about nine months and joined the Bread of Life Church to be a part. And when we did that, um, and came into the church, there was another a family, the Landsmans ended up coming to the church during that season. And so we met Matt and McKenna and Diana during those days. And then, of course, then we went back after nine months. We went back and lived in Missouri, and then Tom came out here, and then we came out here. But now, you know, all you know that Audrey is Audrey Landsman, and she married <laughs> she married Matthew from that season. And it's like, you know, who wouldn't, I didn't know that 
my legacy was going to become intertwined because I met Tom and then we, you know what I mean? Like you guys probably have stories like this too. Like, isn't it amazing how God does those things? And so your children's spouses and your great grandchildren are, could be out of this room. You don't know right? We don't know how God's going to work it all out, but man, let's not miss the opportunity. I'm so grateful to God that Matt submitted his life to the Lord, that he was, is a godly man, and that he, he married my daughter, and I'm so grateful that he hung in where maybe there were times he could have decided to be a rebellious kid, but no, he had a mom that brought him to the house of God, and, and here we are, and so there is reward in the faithfulness and obedience we have to God, there's reward. I call Eleanor my little reward because of all, you know, Audrey, you know, she's wonderful, but she wasn't always perfect. And so all my kids, right? I know shocking, but, but there are reward. Isn't it so awesome? And so God can get, get us where we need to go. And that's, it's just amazing. And of course, Jesus is, uh, um, to go back to the intertwining, of course, that Jesus is the direct line from David out of Ruth's life. So just to close and wrap up, to summarize, or well, not really summarize, but okay, Matthew 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 13. Let's go into the New Testament for a second. All right. Um, it says, then some children were born to him so that he might lay his hands on uh, sorry, brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. So they were bringing, some children wanted to come to Jesus and the disciples were trying to push him off. But Jesus said, let the little children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. So just in that vein of how do we not hinder our children? from coming to Jesus. And we've already got the answer and a lot of the things we've already talked about with Hannah and Ruth, but we, we first have to make him first in our lives. They will see us putting him first or not. And our kids, a lot more is caught than taught is what they say. Your kids are watching. And whenever you interact with your spouse or other people or how we talk about things or how we talk about the church or how we talk about whatever it may be, they're listening. And so they're they're aware. So just be thinking about that. Um, and of course, we've already talked about bringing them to the house of the Lord. To walk obediently, walk righteously, and to know his word. Teach your kids the word of God. It's great that they come to Kingdom Kids, but honestly, nothing's going to ever replace you doing that with your kids, praying with them, reading the word, worshiping with them. You know, do that with them at home and in the house. And then just lastly, we, we can do all we can do. Everything, we can do the, best we very, the very best we can, but in the end, we don't save, save our kids. Jesus saves our kids. And so we do our very best, and that's where obedience and faith toward, the, toward God can be proven out. But in the end, we can't be condemned. If, if our kids decide to go a certain way, you know, we're going to believe God for them, and we're going to always trust, right? So if you have, even have grown kids, we believe God, they're going to come to him. But he, he does, he saves them, and he is faithful to do so. Yeah. All right.